Hi everybody, this is Dr. Nigro with another Chem Calculation screencast. This one's going to be focused on determining the three-dimensional structure of a covalent molecule based off its Lewis dot structure. In an earlier screencast, I walked you through how to determine what those Lewis structures should be. So if you're still struggling with that, make sure you go back and watch that particular screencast because having the correct Lewis dot structure is vital to determining what the three-dimensional shape of a molecule will be. All right, now, a molecule's 3D shape is influenced because of the interaction of what's called an electron domain. All right, an electron domain comes in two forms. It's either a bond attached to the central atom, or a lone pair. On the central atom and please note that both of these are defined from the point of view of that central atom all right so these electron domains I kind of think of them as densities so there are three-dimensional space that contains the electrons and because those electrons have the same charge they repel one another so when these domains orient themselves in three-dimensional space they do so in a way that pushes them as far apart as possible. All right, now we only have so many shapes that can conform to this idea of repulsion, right? But it is the most important factor that influences our three-dimensional shape. As a matter of fact, the theory itself, which we tend to call VSEPR, is the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, all right? And so if you can remember that it's repulsion that forms these shapes, that's gonna help a quite a bit. All right, now there are two shapes that we tend to name when we talk about three-dimensional shape. The first is called the electron geometry. All right, and it's the shape that's assumed by all electron domains around that central atom. All right, so if you could include all domains, bonding and lone pair domains, then that shape that it forms is called its electron geometry. It's the geometry of all the electrons that surround that central atom. All right, the second shape, which is the one we use more often, is called the molecular geometry. All right, and that molecular geometry is identical, oops, sorry about that, abbreviating, to that electron geometry in terms of basic shape but the name the name comes only by considering the ad, the bonded atoms Sorry about that. But named on bonded atoms. All right. And it seems like a fine point, but what, what ends up happening is if you have lone pairs on central atoms, they do influence the three-dimensional shape. So the electron geometry is where you always have to start when you're looking at three-dimensional shape. However, when we name the shape, it's only what we can actually see. And we can't see lone pairs of electrons, but I can see a bonded atom. And I'm, you can't see me, but I'm using quotations because we can't see any of this stuff because it's all tiny, all right? But by determining the electron geometry first, we can then look at that molecular geometry once we know the basic shape, all right? Now, determination or rules that I use to predict these shapes, all right, are pretty straightforward, all right? The first thing you have to have the Lewis dot structure. So you need your Lewis dot structure. All right, and again, as I mentioned, you need to go back and watch that screencast if you're having trouble, because if you don't have the correct Lewis dot structure, it can mess up your shape prediction. Not always, all right, but sometimes, all right? The second thing I do is I determine, I might abbreviate some of these because I'm going to run out of room here. I'm going to determine 
the number of electron domains around my central atom. That's what CA is going to stand for. All right. Remember, multiple bonds count once. All right, so in other words, if you have a double bond, don't count it as two things, count it as one thing, All right? If you have a triple bond, it's one thing, all right? And that's because they point in the exact same direction geometrically, all right? It's not like a double bond splits and goes in two different directions. They are two bonds connected between two atoms, so they go in one direction, all right? So once you have identified the number of, of domains, all right, we're going to use Vesper, to ID our electron geometry. So this is basically going to give us our basic shape for that molecule. All right, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. All right, finally, determine the molecular geometry by covering up any lone pairs. All right, and I'd like to say that, I'm going to write it up here. If no lone pairs, then the electron geometry is equal to the molecular geometry. So if you don't have any lone pairs, you're all set. You can stop at number three and you're done. All right, so again, you need that Lewis dot structure first. Then you're going to determine the number of electron domains that are around that central atom, remembering that multiple bonds count one time. Then we're going to use valence shell electron pair repulsion theory to orient those domains in three-dimensional space so that they are as far apart as possible, and then identify our electron geometry based on that shape. And then determine that molecular geometry by covering up any lone pairs in our structure and renaming that shape based only on what we can see. All right, remembering that if your molecule has no lone pairs, then the electron geometry and the molecular geometry are the same. All right, now down below, I have a little line for shape, all right? That's always going to be the molecular geometry. When you name the shape of a molecule, it's the molecular geometry, all right? I'm also going to draw the shape in three dimensions using wedges and dashes. Now, remember, when we draw these in our on the paper, it's in two dimensions. So we use a wedge to come out of the paper towards us and a dash to go back behind the paper. So it just kind of helps us visualize. All right, so we're going to start. I have the Lewis structures that we did in the earlier screencast here. All right, and I'm going to look at first the number of domains around my central atom. So I'm going to loop them in in blue. All right, so if we look at silicon tetrabromide, we've got one, two, three, four. So I have four electron domains here. All right, now these four domains, as I've drawn them, are basically 90 degrees apart. All right, and if we had two dimensions, that would be the best we could do. All right, but because we have a third dimension, we have that Z axis, all right, then that means we can start to orient them slightly differently in out of the page and into the back behind the page. So instead, what we get is a silicon in the center, so that stays the same. All right, and we're going to put one of our bromines up above, all right, and then another one, st whoops, not narrow, still in the plane of the, well, I guess it's the iPad, but, all right, so these two are both in the same plane, all right, and then what I'm going to have is one bromine that comes forward, and then the third, fourth bromine that goes behind, all right, and this is what it's going to look like in terms of the drawing. Now, you know, this is not art class, so we kind of do the best we can with our wedges and dashes. What I want you to appreciate is that these two bromines, the one down below and the one off to the right that I'm putting dots around right now, all right, are not in the plane of the iPad with the other two bromines. All right, instead, one goes behind and one comes forward. All right, so this orientation helps because the bond angle here is no longer 90 degrees. It's slightly larger at 109.5 degrees. So it lets those electron domains orient themselves slightly further apart than what we saw in our original Lewis dot drawing. All right, now 
obviously the Lewis dot drawing was perfectly fine for what it was, all right? But now that we're talking about three-dimensional shape, we really do need to take into account that third dimension that we have to work with. All right, so this is what the shape looks like. We've got basically, the way I kind of tried to describe it, down below, these three bromines, they're like the base of a pyramid with the silicon at the top of the pyramid, and then above the silicon is the fourth bromine. So, all right, take that as you will. The name of this shape, however, is tetrahedral. All right, now that's the electron geometry name. All right, so we go down and check, and we look, and our silicon has four items around it, four domains around it, and none of those domains are lone pairs, so that means that this is also my molecular geometry. They are both the same shape, all right? So again, when you have four domains, all right, then that means your electron geometry is going to be a tetrahedral, all right? Our bond angle there is going to be 109.5, and in this case, because we have no lone pairs, the molecular geometry is also a tetrahedral. All right, so let's move over to phosphorus trihydride. All right, we check again. We've got one, two, three, four domains again. So we've got four electron domains. And what that tells me is that my general, my electron geometry is going to be the same as what we saw for silicon tetrabromide. All right, it's going to be tetra hedral. All right, so I'm going to draw it with that in mind. I'm going to start with my phosphorus. All right, I'm going to put one hydrogen out to the left in the plane of the iPad. I'm going to put one hydrogen forward with my wedge and then one hydrogen backwards. All right, now remember the Lewis structure tells us we also have this lone pair here and I'm just going to put it on top. All right, so if you look at my silicon tetrabromide, compared to my phosphorus dihydride, we still have that same basic shape here. All right, we've got the three hydrogens forming the base of the pyramid, the phosphorus at the top of the pyramid, and then the lone pair is above. All right, now, for molecular geometry, I can't see that upper lone pair like I could see the bromide in the earlier structure. So I can't call this molecular geometry a tetrahedral. Instead, I have to name it by what I can see, which is a trigonal pyramid, which kind of makes sense. It's a pyramid with a triangular base. All right, now our bond angle here is going to be a little bit greater, so we're going to say that the bond angle is greater than 109. Oh, sorry, I did that backwards. The bond angle is slightly less than 109.5. All right, the reason for that, the alone pair takes up more space than the bonded pairs. And because of that, it pushes everything away just a little bit more. All right, so that bond angle is going to be slightly less because it gets smushed in a little bit down at the bottom. All right, all right, so let's move down to our bromate. All right, and if we look, we've got one, whoops, sorry about that. We've got one, two, three, four, oh, four domains again. Oh, I probably should have changed some of these. All right, which means that our molecular geometry, I mean, sorry, our, our oh, oh, the electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral. just like we saw above. All right, so we start by drawing our bromine. Put one oxygen out to the side, one oxygen coming out front, one oxygen going to the back. All right, you can fill in your lone pairs just like we did before. Now, some of you might ask, well, what about all those lone pairs out around the oxygens? When you talk about shape, it's only about the central atom. All right, so the only atom we're worried about in terms of lone pairs is that bromine. All right, so we've got that same basic shape that we saw before, all right? Now, in this case, we have a lone pair, just like we saw with our pH3 molecules. So the molecular geometry is only what we can see. So in this case, it's, again, a trigonal pyramid, all right? All right, now, if we look at this next molecule, CH3NH2, this is a multi-center, 
All right, so when you have a multi-center, you have to look at each central atom. So we're going to have one, the carbon, and two, the nitrogen. So I'm going to have two shapes here when I write them in, one for the carbon and one for the nitrogen. All right, so let's look at domains for carbon. We have one, two, three, and then this is going to look really weird, four. All right, so for the carbon, we have four electron domains. All right, and if we look at four electron domains, the electron geometry there is going to be our tetrahedral again. All right, and because we have no lone pairs, the molecular geometry for that carbon is also tetrahedral. All right, so our shape for the, around the carbon is tetrahedral. All right, now I'm going to switch colors so we can do the nitrogen. The nitrogen has one, two, three, and then, yeah, this seems weird, four. All right, so for nitrogen, it also has four electron domains, all right, which means that its electron geometry is also going to be tetrahedral. The difference for nitrogen versus carbon is nitrogen has that lone pair, which means its molecular geometry is only what we can see, and what we can see is called the trigonal pyramid. All right, now, learning the names of these shapes is just going to take some practice. All right, so, now, I, we, don't, we do not expect you guys to draw three-dimensional structures of multicenters, but just so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to start with the carbon. So we'll have a hydrogen, a hydrogen coming out of the paper, and a hydrogen going down. I mean, sorry, behind. And then above that carbon is nitrogen. All right, now... Nitrogen is attached to two hydrogens, and this is where it gets a little tricky. So we need one of those hydrogens I'm going to put in the plane of the paper, and then the other one I'm going to send to the back. So it looks a little funky, all right? But what we've got here is a tetrahedral shape on the bottom, and we can see that with our triangular pyramid base. And then up here, we've got a tetrahedral shape, and then when we discount the lone pair, the rest of it, is a trigonal pyramid where the two hydrogens and then this CH4 part make up the base of that pyramid. It's a little weird, which is why we don't expect you to draw them, but that shape is there. All right, now let's move down to these. I added water. We'll talk about water in just a second. Let's start with our CO2 molecule. All right, so CO2, if we look at that carbon, it's got one two domains. Because remember, those multiple bonds, those double bonds count one time. All right, so we have two electron domains, all right? And for two electron domains, the furthest apart that those two domains can be in three-dimensional space is 180 degrees, which is basically how we do our Lewis structure, all right? And when we have our domains oriented in that, we name that shape linear, all right? For this particular structure, carbon has no lone pairs, so that means the molecular geometry is the same thing as our electron pair arrangement. And it's going to look exactly like we drew the Lewis structure. You don't need to redraw it. It's just going to be a straight line with a bond angle of 180 degrees. All right. So let's move over, last but not least, to water. All right. Water has one, two, three, four electron domains. It seems to pop up quite a bit. All right, so those four electron domains, oh, I spelled that wrong. Sorry about that. There we go. All right, tells us that the electron geometry here is going to be just like what we saw above, a tetrahedral. All right, now, here we have a molecular geometry name that's going to be different because two of these are lone pairs, all right? So what is that going to look like? So let's start with our central oxygen, all right? And we're going to put one of the hydrogens in the plane, and then the other one I'm going to have come out of the plane, all right? And that's all I can draw in terms of visible atoms because we have two lone pairs on that oxygen, 
All right, so here the bond angle is different than what we saw before. This bond angle is also less than 109.5. It's actually less than what we saw above because those two lone pairs are pushing on those two hydrogens, so it pushed the two hydrogens closer to each other, which shrinks our bond angle down. All right, now we call this, appropriately enough, bent. All right, so we just have an angle, basically, between the hydrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, and so we name that shape bent, all right? So that's just some examples. There are other shapes that we've talked about. In particular, you can have a trigonal planar, where you have three electron domains around that central atom, and if you have any lone pairs within that, you may end up with a bent shape, or if you have five electron domains around your central atom. Well, maybe why don't I just write them? All right, so let's say, all right, we have, oops, all right, two electron domains. All right, we can have a electron geometry of linear, and our only option for molecular geometry is also linear. All right, if we have three electron domains, and this is not one that we saw an example of, all right, then our electron geometry is called trigonal, oops, planar, all right, which basically if you have just an atom, all of the atoms are in the same plane together and your bond angle is going to be around 120 degrees. All right. Now, we do have some choices for molecular geometry. It could be trigonal planar, and that happens if you have zero lone pairs, or the molecular geometry may be called bent if you have one lone pair. Now, this bent is different than a one above because the bond angle here is less than 120. All right. All right, we've already done four electron domains, so I'm not going to do that again here, All right? But I will do five electron domains. All right, now in this case, if you have five electron domains, they orient themselves in what's called a trigonal by pyramid. All right, now what that looks like is if we have a central atom, we're going to have an atom above and we're going to have an atom below, and we're going to have an atom in the plane, and then we'll have one atom coming out of the page and one atom going back. All right, so in terms of shape, we've got this trigonal plane, and then above we have a pyramid, and then below we have a pyramid. All right, now for our purposes in this class, we, are going to, we aren't going to do any lone pair molecules. All right, so the only molecular geometry we will be working with is also a trigonal bipyramid, all right, which means zero lone pairs. There are other shapes, but we're not going to worry about those. All right, I'll save that for college. All right, then last six electron domains. This is my favorite. All right, our electron geometry there is called an octa hedral. All right, now for shape, central atom, similar to trigonal bipyramid, one atom above, one atom below. The difference here is instead of three atoms in the plane, we're going to have four. So we're going to send one back, one forward, one forward, one back. All right, so if you look at it in terms of shape, We've got this square plane between these atoms, and then we've got a pyramid up top with a square base and a pyramid down below with a square base. All right, so what we end up with is two pyramids on top of each other, eight faces, and that's where the octa comes from. All right, now here are molecular geometry options similar to the trigonal bipyramid. We're only going to deal with octahedral, although there are some fun ones. All right, so we won't have any molecules that contain lone pairs, so zero lone pairs. All right, oh, now I did forget about bond angles. Bond angles here are going to be two types. You're going to have 180 across, 
and then you're going to have 90 degrees. All right. For the bond angles for the trigonal bipyramid, your options are going to be 120 degrees within the plane and then 90 degrees from the plane to the Okay. All right. So that's it. If you need any additional help, please feel free to reach out. I am happy to help.